Hi, Freddie. Hi. Hi, all. How are you doing? Good. Good. Thank <laughs> you. 
things to do like corporate ed or executive ed and then eventually <laughs> Stan, how are you? Stan, Stan, He's our how IT are you? <laughs> Um So does Stan need to use that when he speaks? It would be helpful. Oh, because you're on, on Zoom. You're on Zoom and we have people around the world. Kind of, um, you know, and, and then we don't need it for their room necessarily. We need it for people calling you remotely. Exactly. It kind of re it reinforces. Yeah, I'm just going to be in the front. Is that all right? I don't have to be behind. Nope. If you're anywhere in this vicinity, we have two perspectives. The camera here with audio, and I'll also have my camera. Oh, okay. So it'll be two feet. <laughs> today our uh, speaker, Stan Silverman, and I'm going to say a few words about him before I do. I had a pleasure of meeting Stan at the first Board of Trustees meeting that I went to in, yeah, in September, and we uh, had a good conversation, and I, he shared with me he writes a leadership column, so I asked him to send it to me, and he did, and I started reading them, and I was like, wow, this is so good, so I said, I think that my faculty and staff would really like you to come and share your version of leadership. And he agreed right away, so which I was very happy <laughs> to hear. Um, so I'm really happy to introduce him today. Um, I'm going to read um, formally a little bit of background about him, and then he will do a little bit more introduction about himself. So Stan is the Vice Chairman of Drexel's University Board of Trustees. He is a nationally syndicated writer on leadership, entrepreneurship, and corporate governance for the Philadelphia Business Journal and 40 sister publications across the United States. He is also the former chairman of the Board of Drexel University's College of Medicine and has served in, in board positions for numerous private, public, and nonprofit companies and organizations. Stan is the former president and CEO of, for PQ Corporation and is the founder and CEO of the Silverman Leadership. Um, Mr. Silverman earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemical Engineering and an MBA from Drexel University, so he's one of us. <laughs> and he is an alumnus of the Harvard Business School for Advanced Management Program. So with that, I am delighted to turn the microphone over to Stan. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Thank you. It was a great introduction. So good morning, everyone. Hi, Brian. Good morning. You came over to hear me speak today. <laughs> So you can give me a report card afterward, right? <laughs> uh, everybody, 
Everybody knows where I teach? Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so I thought what I'd do today is um, tell you a little bit about, about my journey and why I'm here and how I got here, and then talk about leadership and, um, and get your views of what you think that means for you. Uh, so we'll do that in a few moments. So, um, so I'm in my third career. Um, never thought I would be doing this uh, five years ago. Uh, but so you never know where the future is going to take you. So all of you should remember that. And so you should all take advantage of opportunities that come your way and make, uh, <clears throat> make opportunities for yourself. Because it'll, it'll lead you to great things. So I spent the first part of my career as the CEO of TQ Corporation, went through 11 jobs, um, served as president of our Canadian company at the age of 36 for three years. Um, came back and then helped build the company out around the world. So when, when we sold the company uh, in March of 2004, um, we were operating in 19 countries with 50 account locations. <clears throat> and I didn't build all of that out, but I built a lot of it out. So I had quite a bit of international experience. When I left uh, TQ after it was sold, I decided that I would serve on boards of directors. So I served on three public company boards, private company, private equity company, trade association, college of medicine here, and certainly the, the board of Drexel University as, as vice chair where I've served for 19 years. And so about four and a half years ago, I got bored uh, <laughs> and I decided I needed to do something else. And so I went with the Close School of Entrepreneurship on its first trip to Silicon Valley. We visited uh, Apple and PayPal, spoke with many, many entrepreneurs in San Francisco. And on the red eye home, I'm thinking, I gotta do something new and different, like these two people are doing something new and different. And so after a month or two, I finally asked myself what I usually ask people who I coach and counsel, well, what are you good at and what's your passion? <clears throat> well, my passion's always been leadership. And I came up through my company studying other leaders, what to do and what not to do. And I just focused on leadership for most of my career, actually. Uh, and I was a pretty good writer. Uh, but as an engineer, and as, as a CEO, uh, not for the kind of things I started for, that I'm, I'm writing now. So I started to write articles in LinkedIn, and I had 15 of them posted when I'm thinking, this is not a really great place to write because the articles kind of get lost and then people can't find them. And so I knew the publisher of the Philadelphia Business Journal, Lynn Kremer, so I called her up and I said, Lynn, would you like somebody like me to write for you on leadership? I have 15 articles posted on LinkedIn. She says, well, let me take a look at them and I'll get back to you. So a week later, she calls back and says, yeah, I think we would like somebody like you to write for us with leadership. However, you need to meet Craig I. He's the editor-in-chief. He makes the final decision about what gets into the newspaper. I will set you up for a lunch. So I'm having lunch with Craig. And a couple of minutes into my conversation, I say, Craig, all my friends say I write pretty well, but they're my friends. <laughs> you read my articles? He said, yes. I said, well, what do you think? He says, I think you write pretty well and we would like you to write for us. Hire an editor or two. In fact, you should get two editors because you've never been trained as a writer and uh, get yourself a website and you can write for us once a month. I said, I want, I want to write once a week. He said, nobody here writes once a week unless you work here every day. Uh, and then you write multiple times a day. Why do you want to write once? once a month I, or once, once a week. I said, I want to write once a week because I want to establish myself as a thought leader in the area of leadership. I said, well, that will do it. Uh, if you ever want to drop back, you let me know, we'll drop you back once every two weeks or once a month. Well, that was 40 years ago. I've never missed a, a week. So I have over 225 articles written. They promoted me to national syndication two years ago. And I just had lunch with Craig about a month ago. And he said, remember we had this conversation about how many times you would write for us? I said, yeah. He said, well, I never thought you would continue to write once a week. <laughs> well, within a couple of weeks, you would drop back. And I said to Craig, I said, Craig, when I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. He says, you are the only person in the U.S. out of our 43 sister publications that writes once a week. People like yourself write once a month or maybe once every two months. And so I'm kind of in a special category with them. Uh, they print everything I write. They rarely edit anything. And they'll, they'll edit the, the title because that kind of controls the number of clicks and that generates advertising <laughs> revenue. 
But lately, they haven't even been editing my, my headlines or my titles for their articles. And I hired two, when I started, I hired two editors from Arts and Science here at Drexel. Um, one was the editor-in-chief of the Triangle. The other one was the chief copy editor. And they basically taught me how to write for what I'm writing. So the, the big joke is, you know, you used to write like an engineer. Now you write like a human being. <laughs> and people are telling me that. And I think that's true. I think I've, I've certainly changed my style of writing. And <clears throat> there's a couple of uh, pathways to the marketplace. Certainly the newspaper, which I'm online, it's all internet. Uh, so every Tuesday morning, uh, I get they publish an article. And then at 1 o'clock Tuesday, I send out almost 1,200 emails to my friends. Anybody here get my emails? A couple of people? Well, if you're interested, uh, let them email and we'll get you. I'll get your emails. I'll get your emails and I'll, I'll put you on the list. Uh, LinkedIn is a huge channel for me to the marketplace. Um, and I get a lot of hits, a lot of hits overseas. And a lot of repetitive hits and a lot of comments come back on what I write. I also use Twitter, which is kind of limited because you're limited to the number of characters. And uh, that's kind of a secondary uh, channel. But anyway, um, I use that. And every once in a while, I'll put something up on Facebook if I think it's going to be read. But most of the time, I kind of keep that myself out of, out of Facebook. Um, so that's what I do. That's what I do. And I added entrepreneurship and corporate governance to leadership because I spent a lot of time coaching and counseling the kids over at the close school. Um, and I support that school hugely with, with funding. I mean, that's kind of our, uh, where, we, where we, my wife and I send our, uh, our uh, philanthropic contributions to the close school because the close school teaches kids how to be CEOs. And I finally, I realized this going through uh, their startup uh, fest day a couple years ago, where I spoke with probably 30 budding entrepreneurs and they're trying to sell me on their business. They want me to fund their business. And I asked them, well, what are your problems? What are your issues? What are you working on? And I wake up the next morning thinking, these kids are learning how to be CEOs. They are dealing with customers. They are establishing their um, they're, they're establishing partners, they're hiring their first uh, employees, which are very important. They're raising money, they're making mistakes, they're pivoting the next day. Uh, they wake up and say, well, what I did yesterday is not going to work today, and so I need to do something different. And they're writing business plans, which are out of date two hours after they write the business plan, of course, because they're, they're doing something that's brand new and you got to take a whole bunch of different, different paths to get to where you want to go. And I'm thinking, this is exactly what CEOs do. So why is this different than what kids learn outside the School of Entrepreneurship? And by the way, the School of Entrepreneurship teaches kids from all over the university. I think it's the number is close to 3,500 students have now been taught by the close school without being enrolled in the close school. So they come from the College of Medicine, College of Nursing. A lot of engineers are there. A lot of people from art, from art and science, people from media arts and design. They're working on their projects. So I'm talking with students from all over the country. And I'm thinking, this is great training because if you sit in a classroom, you learn this out of a book and through discussion with a professor who probably has not done this, these people are doing it real, in real time. They're risking real dollars. They're making decisions, making mistakes, and they're learning how to do that. So as a CEO, when I hire people, I want to hire those kids and not somebody that sat in the, in the classroom for five years or four years and you know, mostly pushed numbers through a spreadsheet. And so these are very, very special kids and that's where we send our philanthropic dollars, my wife and I, because I think entrepreneurship is so important. Even if you work in a traditional company, it's the way you differentiate yourself. So we're gonna to touch on that in a little bit. So if you have the chance to talk with your students and they say, they ask you, well, how did I get my first job as a teacher? If they ask me that question, my answer would be, differentiate, differentiate yourself vis-a-vis -vis your peers. What have you done that's different, new and different, than what your peers have done? How have you moved the state of the art of the technology of teaching forward? And we'll talk about that in a bit in terms of my, anybody, everybody familiar with the AIM School, AIM Academy? They teach kids with learning differences. I'm on the board there. They are cutting edge state-of-the-art in terms of the research on how to teach kids with learning disabilities. My grandson goes there. 
unbelievable place. Well, if I was hiring a teacher for my school, if I was working for the District of Philadelphia, I would say, well, what have you done different than your peers? And I want to hear something different. I want to see something on your resume that's different. So I get a lot of kids that come up to me and say, when you're seniors, grab some kids and say, would you look at my resume? I said, sure. So I look at their resume, pay the back and say, why is this resume different than the other 500 resumes that are going to be submitted to Comcast for that one finance job that's open? How are you going to get an interview? Other than the fact that you may, you know, your dad may know somebody there. <laughs> but how are, you going, how are you going to get an interview? It has to be different. Oh, it has to be different? So you need to be different. So I tease out of them why they're different, what they've done here on campus, extracurricular activities, what they've done during the summertime. And I tell them, from this day forward, you will be different every single day of your life. That will get you the next job internally, and it'll get you the next job externally. And in fact, you want to be so good at what you do, rather than go out and look for a job, you want to have such a great name within your industry, people go after you. You're recruited. So instead of pushing a noodle up a hill, they're pulling you. They want you to work for them because of your reputation and what you've done. And that's how you get the next job. So anyway, I'm, I'm, let, me, let me stop now and just kind of open it up and uh, let's talk about leadership for a moment. So I have to ask you your view, and the people online also, what is your view of leadership within the educational profession? Do I have any volunteers that want to share with me what they think it's about? We'll talk about that. What do you think leadership means to you? Yes. Hi. What's your name? Kathleen. Hello, Kathleen. How are you? Very good answer. Very good answer. Anybody else? So you're being different. <laughs> and leaders, leaders are different. Anybody else? Your view of what leadership means? Yes, all the way in the back. Your name, please? Uh, Jim Cottle. Jim? So, uh, in my role as a supervisor um, at the Institute of Philosophy here, as being a leader in that unit, my responsibility. That's that's a great answer. That's a great answer. That's really a great uh, element of leadership. Anybody else? Oh yes. In fact, I forgot to do that. Sorry. Thing. Anybody else? You want to run that mic? Uh, but my name is Larry Kaiser. Um, it, to me, it's about being a visionary as well as a good gardener to put the resources that are already there and cultivate that. So you're building a, a, a strong tree, you have a strong root about something that's going to last, but you're continually growing and expanding. Uh, but the, the leader really has to have the vision of where that organization wants to go and be open to change. Thank you very much. That's perfect. Anybody else? Hi, I'm Sarah Ulrich, I'm Sarah. Assistant Dean um, for Teacher Education and Undergraduate Affairs. And in the teacher education programs, we focus on teacher leadership. So our candidates who exit the program here at Drexel um, are going to go forth and not just be teachers, we punch a clock and leave the building at uh, 320 if the, their contract says they could end, leave at 320. Um, but to be uh, leaders in the context of their own classroom, so innovators, they're going to go beyond the textbook, beyond the curriculum. Um, so leaders in the context of their own classroom as innovators, leaders in their school community where they may see inequities and may seek um, positive growth and change, and then leaders in, in the profession at large. That's a great answer also. Anybody else? Back here. 
or a Lori Severino. Hi, Lori. Um, I think you have to be passionate about what you do, and I think you have to be willing to solve problems in unique ways. Yes, these are all great answers. Anybody else before we talk about them? Anybody online? <laughs> Have the ability to, to speak online? Yes, they do, absolutely. Okay, well, they're all really great answers. Um, and when I when I talk in front of uh, business folks, uh, where I speak mostly in front of uh, companies and folks that run um, divisions or you know, various departments or CEOs, I talk about two things which really determine the success of a business and that is the culture within the organization. And that's set by the tone at the top of the leader, of the CEO, and the culture that that person, he or she, uh, brings to the organization. And so, in a lot of ways, um, the teacher in the classroom sets the culture and the tone in the classroom. They're right on the front line. Your jobs are very, very important. You are educating the future teachers of America who are educating our kids. There's really no more important job than that when you come down to it. And so each, each of you have, has to decide how you're going to teach your students so that they, when they leave here, they become effective, effective teachers. And so what's every student of yours looking for? They want to be successful. Everybody wants to be successful. So how do you do that? How do you do that? How can you be successful teaching them? Well, a lot of what you've talked about today are elements of that. Um, I have, I'm gonna add, I'm, I'm gonna add one uh, that wasn't brought up, uh, and I think it's pretty important. So you need to create a culture within your organization, no matter where your organization is, whether you're a first line supervisor or you're the dean of the, of the school or dean of a college or the president of Drexel University or any, any organization, where your employees feel that they have a sense of ownership in what they do. So I was taught this um, when I was president of our Canadian company by an hourly worker who worked on one of our production units. His name was Luigi Paolini. See, he doesn't know that he's famous, <laughs> but he really is famous because I've written about him probably two or, two or three dozen times. I've talked about him numerous, numerous times. So, he used to run a small powder mill, which took uh, a raw material and ground it up into small particles, which that material went into uh, refractory uh, resistant or refractory cements that were acid resistant and really uh, resistant to high temperatures. And so this product was growing very, very rapidly. We were sold out on this unit, hadn't put a dime of capital in it since it was really built 10 years uh, previous. And He's working a lot of overtime, kind of a lot of manual work, backbreaking work. So we needed a 50% increase in capacity, and we wanted to make the job easier. And so this is a small unit, but it's very, very profitable. So I'm looking at Dina thinking you know, it's probably a million dollars, maybe 100,000 to a million dollars to expand and get a 50% increase in capacity. And so we could have given the job to the engineers, but engineers only want to work on multi-million dollar projects because that's how they get promoted big things, not this little thing. So I'm talking to the plant manager, and he says, you know, why don't we ask Luigi what he thinks we should do to expand this unit? Take a shot at it. So we call him into my office. Plant manager's there. Luigi walks in, says, am I being fired? <laughs> well, Luigi, why do you think that? Well, I've never been to your office. No, no, no. We're not being, you're not being fired. We want you to tell us how you would expand capacity to get a 50% increase in capacity of your unit. Obviously, you, you must have thought about that in the years you've worked there. He said, oh, I know exactly what I would want to do. Well, why don't, you, why don't you develop the scope and let's review it of what you want to do. He says, I'll do exactly that, but I want help from a mechanic in the plant. And very cavalierly, we said, well, pick your man. So he picks Don McNeil, who was the best mechanic in the plant, but he's horrible with respect to labor management relationships, always wanting to go on strike. Constantly <laughs> filing grievances, just a pain in the butt, right? <laughs> but he's a very, very good mechanic. So I'm thinking, oh my God, this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> but we can't take it back because we told Luigi he could pick his man. So we say to Luigi, why don't you talk to Don McNeil tomorrow and we'll talk to him in the afternoon. We'll ask if he wants to help you. So 
we talked to him in the afternoon. He says, you know, Luigi, talk to me this morning. I'm going to, I'm going to help Luigi, but not for you. I'm helping my friends. I'm not doing this for you. I said, okay, just do it for Luigi. And he says, okay, I will. Well, three weeks later, they present us the scope of what they want to do. And it is so innovative that I, it just kind of blew me away, right? I'm, and I'm thinking like 800,000 is the new it's going to cost. Don McNeil estimates it, which we didn't ask him to estimate. He says it's going to cost $260,000 to do the job that we want to do. Why does he know that? Because he, this is what he does all the time. He works for outside contractors, so he can, he knows what, what things cost to do. I said, okay, uh, you guys are now in charge of building it. Well, that's not our job. You know, it's a project manager's job. Well, I mean, when we do work on the unit, and it's going to be down while you're, while we're, making changes, so why don't you work on it with Don? Well, okay, Don says, okay, I'll do it, but I'm not doing it for you, I'm doing it for Luigi. Two months later, the work is done. Luigi starts up the unit, and within seven days, he's at 50% increase in capacity. It's just purring along. Within two weeks, 14 days, he's at 62% of increase in capacity, and everything's just working just perfect. The project comes in at $250,000, 10 grand less than what Don McNeil estimated. I think he did that purpose of just to show it out. <laughs> the engineers, you know, they, they overrun a project by, by a million bucks. It's no big deal to them, even though it is to me. Right? And so all four of us fundamentally changed by that process we use. So Don McNeil is now walking through the plant being a positive opinion leader rather than a negative opinion leader about management. He's saying, you know, these guys trusted me for what I could do with my mind, in addition to what I could do with my hands. That's a, such a powerful statement, especially from Don McNeil. And now he's our ally in the plant, because we trusted him to get a job done. We told him what the expectation was, and said, just go do it, and he did it. We didn't micromanage him at all. Luigi changed in a little bit different way, which changed me. So I'm taking the visitor through the plant about a month after startup, and we have Four, we had five production, little production units within the big plant. So I'm taking the, the uh, visitor through and we stop at Luigi's production unit, which of course is now just purring along just perfectly. Luigi says, I'll, I'll take the visitor through and I'll show him what this looks like, you know, what my unit looks like. He said, okay. The next day I'm walking through the plant, he says, you know why I did that? Why, why I gave the visitor the tour? I said, why? He says, because this is my plant. This is not yours. It's mine. I'm taking we created a sense of ownership in Luigi because we trusted for what he trusted him for what he could do. Well, from that point on, production went up, costs went down, and I'm wondering, gee, how come I didn't learn this lesson 15 years prior when I started my career? Right? I had to be taught by an hourly person. A couple lessons. Anybody can teach anybody a lesson. No matter if you're the president, you can learn from a guy who's five levels below you or four levels below you. You just have to talk with them and listen to them and respect them. How many CEOs do that in the US, US today or around the world? Not very many. So we learned from Luigi. So that has been part of my management style ever since then. And that was 1986. So that's how long it's been. You always want to empower people, tell them what, what your expectations are, cut them loose, and let them do their job. And if they're good people, and most of the time, you know, they're good people, they know what you're doing, they're going to get the job done and exceed your, your, uh, your expectations. And so it's very important, it's very, very important that you do that with your people. And you teach that to your future teachers in your classroom. It's a very important lesson. So one other thing I want to share with you, and that is, uh, I shared it with Penny uh, about half an hour ago. And so I'm a 26-year-old marketing manager for my company, and we were making Epsom salt on the West Coast in Berkeley, California. And that product goes into agricultural uh, uses, it gets packed in you know, two-pound boxes on shelves of drugstores as a soap, but it also goes into pharmaceuticals. So I get a call one day that the plant found iron filings in these three batches of material. And I'm thinking, it's got to come back. If it goes into pharmaceutical products, the liability is huge. We've got to bring it back. I have no authority to, to do a product recall in my job. And my two bosses, my boss and the CEO of the company are traveling in Europe. It was before cell phones. And so I couldn't get a hold of them. I couldn't text them. I couldn't send them an email. And I had, to call, I had to call this stuff back. And every day that went by, 
the cost of calling it back, recalling it goes up exponentially because it goes out of the distribution. And God forbid it gets put into a, a product of somebody's, then it really goes up. So I ordered a recall. But people are saying, you don't have the authority to do that. Well, wait, it's going to come back. Well, I ordered a recall, and, and people are telling me, either you're going to be celebrated or terminated for violating policy. I said, well, let's worry about that later. Let's just get this stuff back. So we ordered the recall. It cost $550,000 to bring it back. We figured out, we waited one more day. It's a million five. So these two guys get back from Europe, and I told them what I did. Well, I was celebrated for what I did for violating the rules. So I'm thinking, you know what? You want to hire people with great critical judgment and common sense because once in a while, they're going to have to make a decision which violates the rules. If you have somebody that doesn't have common sense or critical judgment and they violate the rules, bad things could happen. You always want to hire people with common sense and good critical judgment. And you can test for that. And in the interview process, you can talk to them about the times that they've done this and what they would do under certain circumstances. And so that stuck with me all my life. And basically, I rose up through the organization violating the rules all the time and asking for forgiveness. Almost got fired a couple times, but you know, I managed to stay around. And had they fired me, they would have deprived themselves of a future CEO that took earnings from 14 million to 43 million in a five year period during the five years of 9 11 and the horrible recession of 2002. So I wouldn't have been there had I been fired. So you want to cut some people a break every once in a while and say, well, you know, he's a little off and he's eccentric and he's not going to follow the rules, but he has good critical judgment and common sense, so we're going to keep him. And so they kept me. They kept me. And so when I hire people, I screen for that. And I talk to them about, give me examples of when you might have broken the rules or when you haven't broken the rules. And I share with Penny today the example of the Walmart, the Walmart greeter who is, Penny probably makes $15 an hour. A couple years ago, they were making like six, but everybody's making 15 or about to make 15. And so he or she watches an elderly uh, individual push a cart from the store to their car and they're having trouble lifting the bags out to put them in the trunk. Well, the greeter goes out and helps. So he's away from his post for two minutes, right? So he comes back and the store manager finds out about it. And because he, broke, he or she broke the rule, don't leave your post, even to help a customer, that person gets fired. So I'm thinking, oh my God, why would that person get fired? And so if I was the boss of a region and I had the store manager reporting to me among other store managers, I'd fire the store manager. So when I hire people, I want to know that they're not going to fire people who are using their good judgment and common sense to help a customer for the good of the store, for the good of the company. So it's okay with me. Now, other bosses, it's not okay. It's not okay. Um, the other example, which I wrote about, where we had a student in the Midwest uh, attending high school. His mom was in the military serving in Iraq. And he hadn't talked to her in um, over a month. So she calls him on his cell phone and talks to her. A teacher sees that. And it's against the rules to talk on the cell phone during school hours. She reports it to the principal. The kid gets suspended. The kid's living with another military family. Everybody was a little bit afraid. You're going to see it keep this kid out for a week because he was talking to his mom who's in a combat zone? Where's your common sense and your criminal judgment? Well, the principal wouldn't back down. The superintendent actually ordered the principal to reinstate the kid. And it looked just so bad. It looked so bad for the school and for the principal. I mean, I wouldn't hire that guy if he was the last person on earth. And he's lucky he didn't get fired. So it's okay to let your people violate the rules when it makes common sense to do so. And you should have a boss that allows you to do it. But you should always hire people with common sense who know this, who know when to, when to do this. And so leadership is not black and white. There's shades of gray, common sense. Brian. How do you think, Stan, that um, common sense has a role as much as it can? I mean, many people would like to be Brian just I want to repeat the question. Brian asked the question for those online. Why do you think common sense is eroded over time 
where people don't use their common sense and don't make the right decisions. Does anybody have an answer to that or a view on that here in this room? Why do you think yes? Litigation. I believe some of it involves the afraid litigation or they're so bound by the rules they can't really see outside the lines. So. Right. That's a very good answer. So people are afraid of litigation. Yes. There are a lot of leaders that uh, actually don't have to know the principles of leadership. So when they lead, they're very insecure as a leader. Therefore, they, they don't know how to actually have the components to know how to give someone the autonomy that they need to do. So they're not being trained. They're not being trained to use leadership principles. They don't know. Anybody else want to share? Yes. Perhaps some organizations or companies are so, um, they want someone that has the book smarts um, and on what's written on paper on their resume or their CV that's so impressive. Um, and they're so smart that they have zero common sense or zero, um, <laughs> you know, personality skills, you know, they just don't know how to relate to people, emotional IQ, things like that. And I feel that some organizations, they want to impress, you know, other people with these people that have these great books, book smarts, but they have no common sense at all. You just mentioned EQ, <laughs> which we're going to talk about, emotional intelligence. Was there a comment back here? Yeah, there was a really interesting uh, presentation um, of the weekend on NPR from a uh, British um, scientist who studies culture. And he was looking at the culture uh, of America as, as we all are at the moment and um, asking the question, why does America not seem as exceptional as it once had? And uh, I used to work with a professor at Temple University. His name is Frank Farley. Uh, he studied uh, type T personality, risk takers. And the country was founded on risk takers. It, it, the people who, who came over here were risk takers. And the innovation that we've seen over the 250 plus years has been for risk takers. And, uh, and there's you know, some discussion about whether or not risk taking is a valued commodity in the States anymore, whether or not we become complacent and what's driving those things. And so in order to, to exercise your common sense and break a rule, you've got to be a risk taker. But if you're complacent or afraid of litigation or that's not reinforced in our society and our culture anymore. You get less of that, especially yeah, it, when it comes to violating and uh, breaking a rule. You're, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. Yes. So I, I think you said some more what I said as well, um, Bill. But I think the biggest part of it has to do with our social milieu. I don't think it's a, it, it boils down to an individual thing. It's more of a our social milieu, a cultural thing that's in, in what, what we're experiencing in the U.S. where the idea of exceptionality has been eroded for more to be more politically correct a lot of the times where you can't afford to be wrong and and to be right is to be within the rules and that and that less and that's even within our schools where if a student steps out of the bunch to, 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 to bend some rule in a in, 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 in a situation where, where it's common sense the school will come down on that, on that particular student so standard based education is evidence of that a lot of the times this is right, that's not right. And so you can even see even further in the way we, the way students are, are, are being, are, are being, are, are being trained or, 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 you know, being educated where there's a winner in everything. No one is, 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 is you know, no one can afford to take a risk to be so far outside the boundary where, where they're seen as an, as an outsider or as you're disenfranchised. And I think that's as due, you know, in, early American history where the country was founded upon on rejecting uh, um, ideologies that didn't conform to the, what people wanted, you know, and now to reject certain ideas is to be seen as an outsider, seen wrong. And I say, I think it's much more than an individual social milieu within the country. And I think to get back to that, it will require, you know, people will complain about education, but it's like a freight, a freight train. Just don't turn so easily. Just don't change directions so easily. That would take a long time for things to get back in the sense of common sense. The common sense is also subjective, and mm -hmm. so subjective is also not seen as something that's highly valued. So, so we ourselves can't change the direction of the company, of the country. Sorry, but we can. We ourselves can't change the direction of the country. 
but we ourselves can change the direction of where we work little bit by little bit by little bit, a little bit at a time. And so that's what we need to do. Uh, you had mentioned um, EQ, or I think you mentioned IQ. I, I was, yeah, I'm not, EQ, IQ. EQ, yeah. So I, th I think EQ is more important than IQ for a leader. Um, I've hired a lot of really smart kids from Ivy League schools and had to fire them within a year or so because they were just so smart. They knew better than anybody else what to do. They didn't want to do it. They wanted to supervise other people, and they wanted to be the CEO after a year. Right? <laughs> and so they were so disruptive. So my, my experience, and this is all qualitative, it's not quantitative, is the best kids come out of schools like Drexel or like a, a state school, Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan, where you know they're they're basically doing and they're not on the ivory tower and they know they're not in the ivory tower so they have to earn their living they have to earn every single day what they do and they're the best performers so i used to get to work at six o'clock every morning when i was working uh driving on the turnpike heading to valley forge from fort washington and in the car i would think how am i going to earn my money today and i was the ceo what am i going to do to enhance shareholder value today by either speaking with somebody or making a set of decisions or encouraging somebody to make their decisions, helping them through it every single day. Now you can argue whether that was you know, appropriate for the CEO to do, but that's what I did. And that's how we drove earnings from 14 million to 43 million in five years. Um, by putting, how many people have read Good to Great? Those who have not, have not read it, Go on Amazon and buy it. Good to Great by Jim Collins. Go on, go on Amazon and buy it and read it over the holiday. It's probably the best leadership book you ever want to read. The first six words of this book are, good is the enemy of great. So if you think you're good enough, you're never going to make it to great. And there's a corollary to that. And so we were doing, I mean, we were going through a recession. We didn't have a down quarter after our first year. So everybody's, you know, sucking with red ink. <laughs> we keep moving from 13 to 43 eventually over five years. People would say to me, this is a great company. I would say, no, it's not. We're pretty good here. We're approaching great here, but we've got a ways to go. In this area, we're really mediocre, but we're working on it. If you, if you as the leader, if you claim that your company is great, your organization is great, everybody stops working and you start sliding back. So you're always on a journey to become great. And it's up to a third party outsider to say that you're great, not the leader. You're always working on a path and on the journey to become great. And that's how we got the $43 million. And then we sold the company. We sold the company after that. So let's talk about emotional intelligence, okay? I read an article. Uh, a couple of months ago, if you go on my website and you, t and you search on the word emotional, it's the first one that pops up. It quotes two professors who really dug into this. And in fact, if you're from the business school, every, all the professors over there know these two guys because these guys are famous in their area. And they go through the, the, the factors which kind of determine whether somebody else, somebody has emotional intelligence or not. And then I follow up with like six or seven items on what you need to do to kind of be successful and show emotional intelligence. That article had the highest hit rate of any article that I've written to date. So it's something that you may want to go on, just search on the word, go to Silverman Leadership on, on the web and type in emotional under articles and it'll, it'll pop up. So what I want to do now is just kind of stop and answer any additional questions you might have before we bring this to a close. Um, Questions from anyone, including the folks online. There was a question from Stephanie online. Um, okay. She's very interested in, in how you feel about the dichotomy of theoretical concepts of good leadership and the lack of leadership by managers, maybe due to not having the opportunity to learn or having a mentor or a role model. Wow, that's a <laughs> complex question. Um, so let me try to answer it this way. There's a lot of people that are put into leadership positions that have the huge potential to become great leaders, but they're given no training at all. I was very fortunate coming up through my company. I probably have gone through seven or eight over my career uh, with the company, seven or eight 
uh, training sessions capped off by 12 weeks uh, at the Harvard Business School in the Advanced Management Program where we lived on campus in Cambridge. And we learned about leadership, we learned about decision making, we learned about a whole bunch of things. So people just aren't trained. So people have great potential. And nobody here works for the city, right? So, I'm gonna say. <laughs> so I have a son who worked at the airport. And so the airport is owned by the city. So he was rising up in the organization at the airport. Just terrible, terrible. Now he would tell me once a week how bad management is. But nobody was ever trained in this stuff, right? So when US Air and American Airlines merge, he gets poached to work in the new company because he knew all the leadership at American and US Air. And he is now Eastern Regional Operations Manager for American. He's one of six people in the company. He has a, a re operational responsibility for Boston, LaGuardia, JFK, Newark, Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia. And he's also the, the liaison to the um, FAA uh, in Washington because he lives the closest. He lives here in Philadelphia. So he tells me how much different it is. It, it, you know, it's the same industry, it's the airline industry, but how much different it is working for American Airlines than it is working for the city. And I said, well, why is this, Eric? He said, because you get so much training at American. Plus, they weed out bad managers. If you're a lousy manager, you're gone. You're gone. And that's something that we should all realize. You're not helping your organization or the individual or the people that that individual is managing if you let them stay in their position and they can't improve. They gotta go. You're doing them a favor because maybe they'll be happier and they'll be more successful somewhere else. Well, it's really hard to get rid of city employees. But in America, it's done all the time as it is in industry. So you should remember this. And you know, you're gonna be teaching teachers that are gonna be working for unions where it's really hard, very, very hard, very hard to replace them if after, and they hardly get training, okay, where they're just bad teachers. You're hurting the kids, they're hurting the kids. So uh, we're not gonna solve that problem because of the union contract situation. But just remember that if somebody is in your organization and they're not performing and you have the ability to move them aside or send them off somewhere else, you gotta do it, you gotta do it. Unfortunately though, they're not being trained, so you may never ever have an opportunity to see them improve. That's just the, the way the world works. Anybody else, questions? I have another question online okay. from Stephanie. Um, what is your perspective on mentorship from inside the same company and mentors from outside? I think they both work. Uh, I've had mentors both inside and outside my company. Um, so if it's inside the company, it's got to be somebody at a high level so that person doesn't feel threatened by you as you may move up through the organization. So they got to be a list the next generation up and they were very, very effective. I mean, once I got hit over the head with a two by four, I mean, literally. I got just absolutely killed by this comments by this uh, this leader. So I was doing things wrong. I was a young kid right out of school. But I listened and I changed my behavior. Had he not hit me over the head with a two by four, I probably wouldn't be with the company. And so he helped. Outside the, the company, it's the same way where you know there's no threat where you're able to take that person's job immediately or there's no threat there. They also don't know the company, but they can give you some advice which is independent and could be very valuable also. So by show of hands, how many people have either have had or had an inside or outside mentor? Good, there's a lot of you. That's good. And so when you reach the point where you can mentor somebody else, it's your job to do that. And you hope that person will mentor the next generation. That's how it works. That's how it works. And so, just remember that that's a responsibility that you have. Additional questions? Anyone mind? Yes. Just a quick question. So getting back to the comment you made earlier about highly competitive, or I'm sorry, the um, maybe critical thinking skills that you're looking for, like being able to create your own destiny. Do you think a company, you know, the highly competitive nature of organization, like schools, for example, how competitive they have become? don't do things the right way, you're not going to get that spot in the top of the school. Do you think that hindering people's ability to um, develop new critical thinking skills? And if so, what would be your perspective on how, as 
leaders and tools they can shift. That's really a great question. So you can't change the culture by yourself. Culture can change over time through the, uh, the help and intervention of many, many people. But if you're an individual and you see something that's not right, there are ways of getting what you want done. Um, first of all, you need, to, you need to talk with your boss, but you don't go directly at he or she. You kind of you kind of do it subtly. So when I was CEO of my company, I used to come up with great ideas, and so I would talk verbally to the CEO, my boss, and I get two sentences out of my mouth. He would tell me it won't work. I said, well, thank you. Let me let me at least finish what I have to say, and then tell me it won't work. So I started writing in memos, and he would read the memo. He has page page and a half memo. He would read the memo, come in and say, boy, this is really a great idea. Let's get it done. So that was my way around his blockage, is that I, I would find a way to, to get in front of him, but it had to be in writing. I wouldn't be face to face. And so you got to figure out ways to do that. Um, let's assume you have all the authority in the world to make a decision, but you think it's a little risky, you're unsure, but you have all the authority in the world to make the decision. It is not a weakness to ask other people what they think that way you bring them into the conversation and you still have the authority to make the decision, but at least you've talked with a number of people and you've gotten other views. It's okay to do that. It's not a weakness, it's a strength. And so by doing that, you also build an informal organization around you where people start to trust you because you brought them into your circle. And so sometimes the informal organization is much more important than the formal organization. In fact, that's how a lot of things get done. So talking to my board, I had eight people on my board when I was CEO. Um, well, seven, and I was the eight, so I had seven people. If I had an initiative I wanted to present to the board, I would have lunch with each one individually before that board meeting and just kind of review it with them and get their feeling. And I get input from them, and maybe I would change it a little bit given their great input, they have great knowledge. So when I went to the board, I would present something that's already been presented to them but maybe modified based upon their input, or maybe not. And everybody's sitting around the table and saying, well, didn't, didn't we talk about this before? Where you go in and hit them right on. I mean, the, the walls go up. Oh, we haven't even talked about that. We're not going to even talk about that. So there's ways of getting around those issues. You just have to figure out in your situation what that way is. So to get back to your original question about critical thinking, people always are thinking critically if, in fact, they're, you know, that, that's their disposition. It's how do you get something done with an organization that may be resistant to change? You got to figure that out. You got to figure that out. Sometimes you got to make a decision and get it done without giving permission. And you know, you ask for forgiveness and not permission. And if your leadership is a good leadership, uh, they will forgive you. They'll, be, they'll celebrate you and not terminate you. And that was my lucky. I was lucky that I, I wasn't fired a couple of times. Believe me. But they were lucky too. Because again, I was the CEO that drew earnings from 13 to 14 to 43 million during a terrible five year economic period. Yes? They could probably hear me. <laughs> I'll repeat. I'll repeat. Um, actually, would like you to speak a little bit about the follow up from what you just said. You talked about how you would go out with each member of the board and talk to them. If you just hit them with something, they say, people will be places to So, from the other point of view, if you're in a leadership position, could you talk a little bit about how not to be that leader that immediately says this isn't going to work and how to cultivate on when you are in the leadership position? So that you won't say immediately it won't work? <laughs> yeah. you, gotta keep an open, you gotta keep an open mind. First of all, the, the people that you're leading, I, I'll give you an example. And it's the same, it's the same boss. So let me extend the extend it a little bit. And so when he left as CEO, when I became the CEO, I was promoted to CEO, I swore that we would change that cultural norm where the CEO, within two seconds of somebody making a suggestion, would shut it down. And so if I was the CEO and the president of our chemical group or glass piece group came to me and said, um, I have an idea, I would listen. Or sometimes, I would say, you know, I think maybe we should go direction A on this issue. And uh, the CMI CFO, Bill, would say to me, 
mm, I think we should go to direction B. How I respond to Bill will forevermore set the dynamic, conversational dynamic between him and I. So if I shut him down and say, Bill, I don't want really to hear that. I want to go to direction A. That's the last time I'll ever get an idea from him at all. He's not going to, he's not going to do that. Why should he do that when I wasn't open to this one? I would say, well, Bill, why do you think we should go to direction D? He would say, well, because of this, this, and this. So we would debate A versus B, B versus A for an hour, for a, a day, for a week, whatever long it takes. At the end of that process, one of three things would happen. I would say to Bill, thank you very much for your input, but we just beat up A versus B, and I really feel confident that A is the right way to go, so thank you for putting us through that process. Or I would say, you know, you just went through this process where we beat up A versus B. I think B is much better. I think your idea is much better. So now Bill feels good because he changed the CEO's mind. But more often than not, in real time, a third thing would happen. And this happened more than 50% of the time during the five years I was CEO. We would find direction C better than A and B only because we debated A and B. And we would implement C. Now, I don't write this. But what actually happened is we never made a mistake. I say when I write that, we hardly ever made a mistake because I get the challenge, you know. I don't want to be challenged. <laughs> so, but the truth is we never made, and that helped drive earnings from 14 to 42. We would debate things as equals. We would debate as equals. And so if you're in a leadership position, you have to have a culture so that your people surrounding you can just come in and say, well, I think this or I think that. Or I, don't, I think you're wrong. I think we should do this. And I'm just the kind of CEO that says, well, what do you, why do you think that, you know? CEOs aren't God. We have jobs just like everybody else. We make a lot of mistakes. But the one thing that a CEO or a leader of a department has is the ability to open up and say, well, why do you think that? Let's talk about that as an equal. Even when you're, we, yell, we yell and scream at each other. I mean, there's a lot of passion in a lot of conversations, and it's okay. But we always came out with the best decision and drew the earnings and drew the right decision strategically and we grew the company. So I hope I answered the, your question. Yes. I have a comment that leads up to a question. I have a comment a question, and especially with the idea of good is, a, is the enemy of great. And I think this goes back to the, to the, to the, to the prevailing theme that I see in this is basically. You know, or a social milieu affecting what does it mean to become really exceptionally great, risk taking, favoring failure over being safe. And I think a prevailing force in many companies, universities, and I, and I wrote this down because I've been thinking about it, is the outcome of being right, being correct, meeting the expectations of the public or shareholders for that matter. And I feel the outcome focus or favorability over process focus, which involves more risk, more opportunities for failure, is often frowned upon. So if the process does not matter to people, meaning the process of taking more risk and that kind of stuff, people are going to favor outcome. And if outcome is the option, people are going to buy for safe and good enough. And if that is the case, the value of risk means that you have to value failure at some right. point. Right. If you don't value failure, your value is to safe, you value doing things the easy way, by your um, outcome. But in our litigation obsessed society, which we, we, we people sue over every single thing, we have aimed to become safer. We focus less on taking risk. Even Wall Street, you know, well, if a company takes too much risk and don't meet certain profit margins, they're punished by shareholders. Universities do the same thing in terms of how oh, we create courses. If you, don't, if you don't build a course that meets public demand, even though it may not be writing for the long run, Students don't enroll in it, you can't do it. So the question is, what are ways in which we, the society, and the leadership, can aim to overcome what I call cultural stagnation, stagnation as, as, as it relates to fail first, and fail often as the, as the, as the case with certain with some companies? How do we overcome that? That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, great, that's a great question. So, I think we all need to learn how to take responsible risks. Well, what does responsible risks mean? What it means is that you look at all the possibilities of what the outcome could be, and if the decision goes wrong and you sink the company, 
maybe you need to think about that because I'm not talking about making decisions that sink the company, even though sometimes you do that. So Boeing, when they designed and built the 747, they, they rolled the dice and they risked the company. But they were really confident, really, really confident that they could pull it off. So you're always trading off probability of success versus risk. And so they made the decision to do it. Very few people make decisions that put the company at risk. So the higher the risk is for a decision, the more you talk about it. You talk about risk versus reward. You're always doing that. You're talking about risk versus reward. That's why I like entrepreneurs so much because they're learning in real time while they're in college where they're not going to kill anybody or you know, kill their education. Uh, what they're going to do is run out of money and maybe their idea will go bankrupt and the next day they start at something else. They learn how to do this. They learn to risk all the time. They learn how to make mistakes all the time. That is a very, very valuable uh, uh, skill out in the marketplace because when, when they go to, to, to to interview for a job, they can explain how they're going through all these failures. Well, you don't want to work for a company where the boss doesn't value that. It means that boss isn't going to let you take risks. And so it's all, it's all a trade-off. It's, it's all a trade-off. So where I am is I only want to take responsible risks. I don't want to take risks that I could sink the company unless I'm absolutely sure, absolutely sure it's going to work. So everybody has their own level of, of risk taking. Uh, and that's just the way the world, and, and you, you kind of do that, you're, you're, you should be doing that mentally anyway. You should be doing that mentally anyway. And you know, are we too litigious? Yes, we're too litigious. But you can protect against litigation and still get what you want. So I'm in a situation now with a board that I'm on where we're not protected against a risk where there's a high degree of litigation. So we're gonna put steps in place to ensure that that risk is minimized. It has nothing to do with making decisions to grow the company or becoming great. And I always, I always would tell our people, and maybe I should bring this to a close for some time. Tell me, tell me. Yeah, like five minutes. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. And so when, when you're in a situation when I talk to people, and competitiveness is very important to me. Okay, so we had three or four large, large worldwide competitors in our business, depending on which business it was at DQ. But we had some really very, very good competitors. I would say to our people, we want to become so good at what we do, so so good at what we do, that when a competitor knows they're going up against PQ Corporation for a new piece of business, they say. Oh no, not those guys. No, I write the word no, but you know what the word it really is. It starts with S. <laughs> and you strike fear in the hearts of your competitors so that they know they can't compete against you. That's how good you want to be. And that's how you become the preferred provider of the new marketplace. And so I used to write that a process of continuous improvement is really the holy grail of a company. It's the one thing everybody wants. I don't write that anymore. I think becoming the preferred provider in the marketplace is the holy grail, which means that you are so, so good at what you do for a number of different ways that customers and clients within your marketplace come to you first before they go to any competitor to get a product or service. And in fact, they will pay you a premium for that. And we all do that. I mean, how, how many of us have uh, work in our house and we only use them because they're always on time, the price is always fair, they come back if something's wrong. Well, you want to use that person all the time. They become the preferred provider, whether you're putting a roof on a house or you're, you're building and marketing jet engines or you're a hospital or you're a physician. You want to be that person that people go to. And so therefore, you should always ask yourself, and I always ask myself, are we the best in the world at what we do? And if not, why are we not the best? And then you're on a journey to become the best. Because in my mind, the opposite of that is, well, you, you want to become the most mediocre person in the world or what you do? I don't think so. So you're always on a journey to become better and better and better because it improves your, um, your competitiveness. And if your competitor does it better than you, you're in trouble. And if you do it better than your competitor, they're in trouble. And so you always want to be 
the best in the world at what you do and have your competitors fear you when they go up against you. That's how good you are. And you're always on a journey to do that. One more question, maybe. Hmm? Anybody? Yes. Sure. Bill Lynch. I don't know. Uh, um, did you ever find yourself at various levels of your career in leadership positions trying to reconcile the, uh, in, in the context of making decisions, trying to reconcile what was in the best interest of yourself and the best interest of the organization? And how did you come down on that? Yeah, that's really a great, that's really a great question. Um, so human nature says you're going to do what's in the best interest for yourself. Um, and occasionally, I admit, uh, that's what I did. But the way I did it was in, was in the best interest of the organization. And when I stepped down, uh, when the company was sold, it was really in the best interest of the organization because the new owners were going to take the company to another level. And they had their own guy with a lot more experience than me. So I went happily. I mean, you know, okay, it's time to go. It's time to go. Then you can do something else. Um, but in general, you need to find a way where you're doing what's in the best interest of the company and yourself. And so you just need to figure out what that, what that is. Because it's against human nature to harm yourself. And so you need to figure out what that is. And it's an angel question. It's really almost un unanswerable. It really is. Yes. I have a couple of comments and questions. Yeah, sure, sure. Let's talk about this. Freddie Reesman says hello. Hi, she Freddie. mentions that uh, our creativity and innovation program provides a parallel structure to your leadership's problem. Primarily, uh, the tolerance of ambiguity, preventing premature closure, taking smart risks. Um, original ideas, divergent, hybrid, and convergent thinking, elaboration, intrinsic, and extrinsic motivation. That's from Freddie. In addition, John Gould asks, how do you see the impact of disruptive technologies, artificial intelligence in particular, on the role of a leader and or a manager in the future? That's really a great question. Uh, hello, Freddie, how are you? <laughs> Thanks for your, com for your comment. So, yeah, so technology out there is changing all the time and you need to be on top of it. And you have to decide when it's time for you to be part of the development of the new technology or the adopter of the, that new technology because you're neither, you're going to get caught behind. And so, does everybody in this room know what a BlackBerry is? <laughs> <laughs> I used a BlackBerry from 1999 when it first came out to about 2010. And it was the best thing in the world, actually. Um, and people used to say that I was you know, part of the crackberry <laughs> group of leaders. But then they got, they, they got pushed aside by Android and by iPhone. And I didn't convert right, right away because I was so wedded to this thing. And I finally decided, you know, I'm going to be left behind if I don't convert. So I got my wife an iPhone first, but I used it. And I tested everything out in terms of its speed, in terms of just about every, every functionality. And when I was happy with it, I let her use it, and I went for, went for myself. And I'm not done that. And there's some people today in the world that still use BlackBerry. Well, they can't surf the, surf the web real well. They can't get news instantaneously. I mean, there's a whole bunch of functionalities. They can't take photos as well as the other their competitors. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll go back. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm saying they finally woke up, right? So you have, you have to stay on top of technology. You got to stay on top of technology and make decisions when you want to switch over. And I, I was probably two years late when I switched over. I have one last question on okay. from Joyce Pittman. Um, imagine a job where your work isn't appreciated, your efforts go unnoticed, and you could be replaced in an instant. Not exactly a place you'd want to stay for very long, is it? As a manager, this isn't the type of environment you want to encourage. Not if you want your employees to stick around, that is. So one of your most important responsibilities is making your employees feel truly valued, letting them know uh, that without them, your company, your department, and frankly, you would be worse off. But how would you do that on a daily basis, especially if you don't want the decision-making power or resources of top-level uh, well, that's probably a, a, a question and a problem and an issue that most people have sometime during their, their career or maybe uh, for a, a good part of their career. All you can do is control what you do and in your space. And 
I, I give this answer when it's a similar answer to the question, what if you work for a tyrant? What do you do? What do you work, what do you do if you're in an organization where it's so political, people are shooting at each other all the time? And what I tell people to do, and it's similar, is that you do the very best job you can, you let the work speak for yourself, and you build um, alliances with other people, like-minded people within the organization, so that they will tell you when somebody's shooting at you, or when somebody's not appreciating you, and you can tell them, and just do your job. And someday, that boss, he or she, may go. And you get somebody else in who's more enlightened. Or you can make the decision to leave. But when you leave, make sure that you're different. So when you put on your resume that you've done A, B, and C, it stands out that, oh my God, this person is really different. I want to talk to this person for an interview. That's what you have to do. And ultimately, I mean, if you're really, really good, you become known in your industry so that when a job opens somewhere across the country and it's opened by a competitor, they call you, they headhunt you to come out and interview for the job. That's the best. That's not pushing it off the hill. That means you're being pulled in. So that's what I would suggest. Thank you very much for those of you online, for those of you that are pressing through. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Um, that was, I'm very motivated. Um, what? Oh, yes. Um, can we give uh, Stan another round of applause? So um, I've been known to be a gift giver, so we have some, <laughs> some gifts to give you uh, in appreciation for coming here and giving us um, uh, your knowledge and experience on leadership. So, so. Oh my, multiple. Multiple gifts, yeah. Multiple gifts. Oh, this one's heavy. Oh here's the first one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And here's the second one. Thank you very much. So, really appreciate it. Yeah, so we, now that you've come here and um, spoken with us, we consider you part of our family now here in the School of Education, so you're welcome anytime. <laughs> um, I'm sure some of us will be reaching out to you for advice, mentorship perhaps. Uh, advice if we're thinking about looking for another job, but thank you for all that the advice that you gave us experience was very Appreciated by all of us. Thank you again. We have a few we have like 15 20 minutes to do some networking talk to Stan um, Before we wrap up. So thank you everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, thank, thank you.